You, you know, I, I can't describe why Lion. We have thrash metal to my grandma. And you know, to thrash people, we're Julio Iglesias. Somebody told me we are playing rock and roll music. I say that's fine with me. In November 82 in Brooklyn, New York, uh, at the famous rock club called L'Amour. I was born and raised in Denmark. I spent my first 18 years in Copenhagen, Denmark. As any other kid, I grew up with music, I loved music, I could play acoustic guitar, and I sang in the local uh, youth club, you know, where we spent our time after school. But it was never, even in my, my head, I've ever become anything, you know, within the music business, stuff like that. It's a church I was baptized in. I don't know if I got all of that. Come along. We're shooting the farm again in case I hit the wrong button, but that's the farm where he birthed the car. And there's the house that he grew up in. There's the pond he ice skated on, his brother fell in. There he is now with his car, and there's the church they put water on his head and he had a dress on. My parents just got me a guitar for my 13th birthday, and I didn't ask for one. When I got it, I didn't complain. I said, yeah, it's not like I said, no, I want a drum set. I never even said a word. They just knew, I guess. And, and it's always been like, went from bands, you know, garage bands, to playing in clubs, high school dances, onto this, onto that, onto a record deal, onto Madison Square Garden. It was, it was not like, bang, something happened. Brokenheart was the first song that Vito and I ever wrote in, in 1983. I think we had probably known each other for about a month and a half. And, and we got involved with some, some people that sort of later on ended up being our management. And they say, hey, well, we need some songs. We need to go in the studio, do a demo so we can sell the band and, you know, get the whole thing going. And he came over to where I was living in Queens, New York. And one night we just sat up with acoustic guitar and we wrote that song. It was the only single off the Fight to Survive record. And we did a video for it, which we financed ourselves for $10,000. Yeah, for only for Japan. We, yeah, we shot that in uh, New Jersey in a theater, just uh, with a video camera, instead of filming. And, and to get it to sort of not look like we were performing up uh, on, uh, on a game show with all the, co you know, how a video sort of looks. Uh, there was so much smoke in the room that like two days after, we still couldn't breathe.
next song is a brand new song which we wrote. It's a song about how you feel when somebody you love goes away. It's a song called Wait. It was a song that I came up with on the guitar from Christmas 1985, and he had, he had, you know, he goes home for Christmas, back to Denmark. And we got together, and he said, so what did you do over Christmas? The second I played it, he sang the words, wait. It was the first thing out of his mouth. And from that day, everybody, our manager was upstairs, was like, bang, that's a hit. First single of Pride, no video. They just put it out, and it took like eight months for it to do anything. Everybody was like, yeah, it's all right, you know, nobody was playing it. And then we said, well, we got to do a video, and we did the video, like, really cheap, because it was our first video. And MTV banged it out, and it just became this huge hit.
Hi, right, this is the brand new white line with quicker cleaning action. <laughs> When you start a band, you don't know how it's going to be a couple years down the road. And when Vito and I started Wild Line, we were together for about a year and a half before anybody else came into the band. We had a couple different members, and finally, in the end of 1985, we settled on James and Greg. We played with James and Greg from 85 to, to 91. After we came back from Europe, I think it was just in everybody's mind that this wouldn't work as well anymore. So uh, when you part, you look for new members. You don't suddenly say, okay, we're parted, we're stopped. I knew I wanted Tommy from when I've seen him play with Lita Ford. I always thought he would be perfect with White Lion. I never thought about Jimmy because he just wasn't on my mind because I guess YT hadn't been doing anything, so he was on my mind. But the second he called me, I was just, yes, that's it, that's the band. And so far right now, it's just, it's great. A friend of mine called me and said, um, White Line needs a drummer right now. I'm like, oh, I know those guys. So we just got on the phone and uh, they asked me to come down and hang out more than play, because they, they used to watch me play when I was with YNT, so they knew how I played. So, uh, and that was it. It was just more a matter of everyone getting along. I, you know, I just enjoy playing rock and roll. It's what it's all about, you know? It isn't like the cars and the women and all that crap, because I've, you know, I've been doing this profession for four years and I haven't seen too much of that stuff. It's just been a lot of the rehearsing and the, you know, the sweat and the blood and all that other stuff that goes with it. A lot of people don't realize that, you know. They just see, you know, the up front of what they, you know, they see. They see you on stage, they see the lights and they see all the, you know, all the paparazzi and all that crap. But when it, you know, when it comes down to it, the real thing about being the band is, you know, everybody pulling off for, you know, you're all together, you know. always hanging together it's you know sometimes I forget we're a band and I think we're just friends you know with the new guys it's just really a matter of just say really hey let's do it <laughs> It's tough if you can't go on stage and really feel great together. So now with the new guys, it's just like, by the time we end up on stage, we're gonna have so much fun, and the kids will read it in our eyes, and that is the whole point. And see, my old drummer would never do this. That's, that's the difference, you know, what's new about white line. It's like you get jerk offs, like. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are full but, members uh, of the band. You guys can come over and hang out with us.
Tell me, I, you know, I don't even remember writing that song. It was just like so long ago. It was like 1980, summer of 86. And we just put together the demos for Pride. And... I remember you, we wrote it in a way high key. We wrote it in G. Uh, huh. It's like oh, two high. It's high like, oh, it is in G, so we wrote it in C. It in something. Ah! That's our second video. That's our second video. And uh, again, the trio. The classic warehouse, the big stage, lots of light, and you know, here comes the band.
it's very easy for us to work together on the songs. He does not need to tell me what to sing, and he knows if he sits in New York and writes a song, he knows what I'll do. And that's like, a, you know, a, a good jam session, you know, it's like you don't need to tell, oh, go to A. When you go to A, the guy's already there. And that, you only find that once in a while. I could be laying there and just like start humming something in my sleep or awake or whatever. I'll just pick a guitar and it's like, we well, hear something and, you know, I understand vocals, so it's like not just music. And I could, you know, the mic comes over and he hears what he hears. It's just this combination. He'll start singing and that's, bang, it's a song. <laughs> On the first record, we just used a little Walkman and acoustic guitar, and I was just tapping on my legs, and Vito was playing. And we sort of almost did that on the second one, too, we, although we added a four-track. This time, we got hold of this little baby, eight-track studio. And they, so you, that means, actually, um, as you're writing a song, okay. so we're gonna you can put, the, you know, you put the drums yeah. down on, and the drum machine, you know, They're guitar, right? bass, yeah. and, and vocals. Play, you know, so even though the whole song is not written, Make sure so you still get a pretty good zero. idea of, of how it sounds. Instead of wasting time in the studio, we wasted the time or we utilized the time in our apartments writing the songs. Every time you go in to do a record, you take from, you know, from anything you have experienced through the year, you tour and stuff like that, and you know, like you, lyrics or whatever, you reflect, you know, you reflect from what you've seen around the world, you know, a little kid crying somewhere, you know, like, you know, something else, two people breaking up on the street or something like that, you know. I never ever write from personal experiences. I don't know if that's good or bad, it's just, uh, because then I would lie a lot when it comes to love songs, you know, like, how can I write Broken Heart, how can I write this? I really just go along, but then again, I write about something that's real, and I think that's the whole point. When the Children Cry, I came up with that acoustic thing. I was working on some classical piece, you know, I came up with the riff. And just played it for Mike, and we made a song out of it. We did it in Germany in 1986 as the demo for the Pride record. Came out great, so yeah, we got to put it on the record. And um, when we did it as the demo at Lemoore one time, we were on the stage, and it was just me and Mike because the other guys didn't know the song. We said, "This is perfect. Let's not put any bass or drums on it." So we left it off. I thought the words went really along with the song really well, and I'm very, I'm very proud of it. And as we could see, you know, the song did really well for us. It's a song that lasts forever.
What's going on? A new guitar prototype. Very nice. Got a new headstock, I see. <laughs> yes. How do you like it? <laughs> That's the only Steinberg I've ever seen with a headstock. She had the longest place that I loved to climb. She had a secret door. Ooh, I like to find it. I think what, what makes a woman sexy in my eyes is probably not what makes a woman sexy in somebody else's eyes. She had the biggest tits and the tightest lips. She had a face like my uncle. I like a woman to be independent. She's got everything that I wanted. Sophisticated and elegant in one way, but at the same time, I would very much like her to put a pair of cowboy boots on and jump on a horse. We're on our way to the hotel. Now, why are we going to the hotel, girls? Oh, you know, I like it when they're, uh, you have to use your imagination. That's, you know, sexy to me. I like a woman with a lot of ambition, a lot of drive. A nice body is a plus as well, I mean, and uh, a good sense of humor. It's more like... I hate to say aura, but it's, you know, it's the way they hold themselves. That's what's sexy. That's what, you know, pulls you toward them. Little Fighter, we, we were working in a, in a cheap motel room in Palm Springs right after the Pride Tour. I'd written down a couple of notes through the tour, which subjects I wanted to write about, and the Rainbow Warrior, the whole thing about that I want to write, but I didn't want to write a story. I just sort of wrote like a tribute to, you know, a good cause again. And that was a song that I think some people mistook because it's like, oh, here they are doing this Greenpeace song. I'm, what does that to do with anything? It's, it's a song, to, you know, a tribute to, you know, to, you know, a ship that they lost. But really it was Little Fighter. I also saw... Here's this little person fighting, you know, like the government or something like that, you know. And it's, 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 it's one of my finest. I'm very happy with it. Mark. Two, three, four. Hi, Hi we're in Red Lion. Stay, uh, stay tuned for our new video. video, Little Fighter. We were in the middle of rehearsing for the big game tour. We got like a knock on the door and, you know, my man who comes in, you know, with the director say, oh, this is the director. That's directing the video, you know, that you're doing in a couple of days. And then we got on stage, there was like too much light and the clothes we had on was too colorful for what it was. It just really contradicted each other, you know, and it really was not what I wanted with the video. I really I wanted to do a video that something sort of said something about the song.
crying tonight. Are you feeling alright? I tell the world that you are dead. a good song and that was it. I had no idea it was so complicated. I had no idea that you had to write a great song and get it captured the right way and have the band look the right way and be at the right time and whatever. It's like, oh, well, you're a glam band? Well, street bands are what's happening now. It's like timing. And it's like a radio station. Maybe that guy doesn't want to play your album because he's getting too many singles that week and the politics of it money aspects and this or that, it's like, she, you know, I thought it was just write a good song. I mean, we gotta be honest, you know, sometimes we lose completely track with what we're doing, because so many voices on the outside are screaming, do this, do that. It's, it's lawyers, it's it's uh, legal things that, that kill a band, you know, that say, you have to break up because 
your contract says you uh, are in debt to these people and that, you know, and it's like all this stuff, it's all the business. And unfortunately you have to pay, pay a lot of dues and, and you have to make a lot of mistakes to learn. It's just really be yourself and don't change. And if you can stand on your ground and people will trust you and people will believe in you, if you really show that you, this is the way it's going to be and this is the way you're doing it. Great I love was uh, just, uh, we started the big game right we were in the studio the first day, we got a phone call, so you gotta do a B-side for a Japanese single, and we're like, well, I'm sorry, we're not writing a song, you know? Because we don't go into the studio, we go, if there's 10 songs on the record, that means we wrote 10 songs. So we didn't have any extra tracks, so we said, we're not gonna stop the album just to write a B-song, a B-side, for some other country, nothing against Japan or Europe, whatever, it's just that we couldn't do it. So we said, well, let's just do a cover tune, and Mike just said, Radio Love, and it was like, done perfect. And then when we listened to it, we said, this, this is cool, why don't we put it on all the records, not just for Japan or something. There's the lyrics. I didn't do anything on the lyrics. It don't was ask, already written. Don't ask him about lyrics because he didn't write them. How long do you think we've done, how long since I'm done? The sun goes down, no? I mean, the sun no, we said, creepy. what do we want to do in the video? We were, every, each guy, we said, you each get your own little segment. So each guy wrote down what they wanted to do in the video, and then we went to the director and said, here's the video. So we did it the opposite way. But you wanted to drive that car. You didn't right. want to stand in the phone booth. Exactly. They wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let anybody drive all the rented cars, so. <laughs> and I was like, it turned out to be our favorite video, and it was the only one that we did.
people in bands are the biggest fans of them all because to become a fan of music enough to like give up so much and to like go through all this all the shit that happens to you as a band member or just trying to make it you have to be a real big fan you know it's not like we were fans of music and we, then we said okay now we're 24 years old let's be doctors or let's be lawyers so i mean i don't think you get to be more of a fan than a band member whenever i go into my my archives of records or cds or whatever i always see i mean i was it was funny because i was thinking about it today i keep picking stuff from the 70s it's like you know queen and thin laces thin laces is my major my main you know like influences you know I'm, I'm like a fan this is what i do about five minutes before I go on stage uh this is my favorite song it's uh southbound and listening and it's from the, the live album live and dangerous my favorite album of all times and uh listening to phil line it just calms me down drifting like a dover chasing my career from the ship's back in the harbor new horizons Van Halen is still my favorite number one band. I could listen to them all day. Aerosmith, uh, Ted Nugent, the Bachman Turner Overdrive, you know, the Stones and all that stuff. So that's what I, was, what I grew up on musically and Kiss. Skid Row, Winger, the Atlanta Miles, Atlanta Miles <laughs> Mr. Big. Who else is on Atlantic? <laughs> Can I get your autograph? Sure. Do you mind? I'm a good personal friend of Mike Saldana. I don't believe this, man. <laughs> Can I walk in Go here? Ahead. Yeah, please. How you doing, man? I'm Would you sign Eddie this for me? Allen. You're not Eddie? <laughs> Where's Eddie at? Why did I know he was going to think I was Eddie Van I Allen. thought you were from a distance, man. Ah. I was so jazzed. I've heard him over here for two days, and I've been ah, going nuts. I knew it. Did you get this all on camera? <laughs> ah. Why did I know you were going to think I was Eddie Van Allen? No, I'm Vito. I put the white line in. Oh, How's it hi, Vito. You guys are good, too. See? Were you over here last night? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, yeah, we're rehearsing. Eddie Van Halen's just in that room. Just, I mean, I don't know if you can get somebody to autograph that. But... Just go in and ask somebody if you see somebody laying around. I, I don't nice have nothing to do with Van Halen. Yeah, nice meeting you. So, uh, see, this happens every day, getting mistaken for rock star, you know. <laughs> Cry for freedom. He had this really heavy riff, but we just couldn't get going on it. And then he programmed the drum machine with some reggae beat and started playing completely different to it. And I started singing like Bob Marley. And then little by little we changed it. And it was like right away, I knew exactly what I want to write about. And it just, the song had such a feeling, you know, and, and right away it just sort of brought me back to, to what was going on in South Africa at that time. And it just, it was an, it was, it was also a challenge for me because it was another subject that not every rock band was just dealing with. And live we do it, I just do it with, uh, with our keyboard player Bird Diaz. You know, I just do it like a cappella on stage and it's like, because the lyrics are very heavy and uh, it, it, you can sort of play with them. And I feel very good when I do that.
know, we did the video in Paris while we were playing there in, on the big game tour. It's actually a video that really was never really seen because uh, people pulled it. It's, it never, it was, I think it was only shown really once on MTV. So actually the ones who got this home video, I guess they could see it, you know. the fans sing along with the song before we feel like oh yeah that's why we did this record you know no matter how great we, we we think a song is it's only until we see those first 10 rows or whatever that we can see sing the song back to us that we say 
Oh yeah, remember that day in July when we were busting our ass? This is the reason why. It's like, oh, now I know why. You know, a lot of people feel like you should just go on the stage and be like one of the kids, like in the audience. I feel like when you pay twenty-five dollars for a ticket, you should give them something that they fantasize about, something that they couldn't have, and something you can't just buy in the store. Start checking into the hotels every day, and it's a lot of fun. All the different people you meet. There are so much going on. Just every little thing that you you don't start looking at it as a story on the road anymore. You are living your life. It's like in 50 years when you when I'm TV anyway. Mike Tramp, this is your life. Do you remember when you met, oh no, not her. And then you go, that, you know, it's like, so there's so many things, you know? And, but we, we normally sit and tell them on the bus. We go over them and you just go, oh no, yeah, remember that?
Love don't come easy. Love don't come easy was the same thing as wait. It was like the second, second we did it. It was like, bang, he came up with it right away. You know, do you want it, do you need it? Love don't come easy. And it's like, everybody was like, hit, major hit. Ready, roll sound. Come in there, you've written a song, you're like, you, you carry the song like a baby. You know, then the, the director sees, hears a song and, you know, comes up with a script. And within a week, you know, it's like you're in there doing the video. The video wasn't exactly what we wanted, but it was cool. All right, man! <laughs> this is way cool, man. This is way cool.
whole main attraction project was 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 such so important for us to come back. And it was like every step we took from writing the songs to making the demos to getting into the rehearsal studio to getting into the studio and finally laying down the tracks and really hearing, yes, we got what we need. It was a blast recording this record because we were so, we had like a vision, you know, like on the record, you know, it's like, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. There wasn't much. We didn't go fishing in a you know in a pond where there wasn't any fish. When we were writing a song. We were we were constantly thinking of a fan, you know, we weren't thinking of us, we were like, God, we gotta show these kids what we can do, you know, like, we can't let them down. So, the music on the record is our way of saying thanks for letting us still be here. We were not happy in, in the way with the the broken heart, uh, with the love don't come easy video. We said, hey, we'll do an extra video, and that was broken heart. And we brought a film crew to uh, to Europe, and we said, listen, we don't care what you do, just film us for two weeks. Everything we do, going in the bathroom, waking up, doing this, doing that, doing this. And I think Radar Love and, and Broken Heart is. It's the two videos the band was most involved in and the, the, band, the two videos that we loved most. She left me
sounds a lot better. One, two. I still don't think that I've grown all the way yet. And I still hope never really to outgrow my youth. Uh, you know, because it's like once you stop playing, you know, you get old. And we all don't, who wants to get old? <laughs> You know, we not, might not be playing the biggest stages and we might not be selling, you know, like trillions of records, but we have a great time and we have been around the world and we have seen it from, from a different view. That is worth a lifetime, what we have seen in the years we've been together. This guy here, I've been together with since 1983 and he, he's the best friend any guy could ask for. And Dito, I love you.
See ya.